This is an Audio Wool original. This episode of Fright Day is brought to you by Drinks of Hell Chipotle Hot Sauce by Fright Day. Bold Chipotle flavor blended with habanero peppers for just the right burn. Kissed with garlic and passion fruit. Zero human blood, like none at all. Visit shop.frightday.com before the first batch disappears. Hey guys, thanks for listening. If you'd like to support us, go to patreon.com slash frightday. Hmm. I don't hmm. know. Just want to make sure this works. Everybody ready? Good. I'm worried about where that's going. <laughs> Fire emergency. Please don't talk to me. I'm sorry. Today they found the bodies of at least three young boys. Six more bodies under the John Gacy house. And one longtime acquaintance describes Dahmer as one weird dude. Stay tuned for Byron Serial Corner. God, I feel like that's bad. Oh, Kelly, here we are again. We're doing Weird Week? I mean, you just heard the foreboding theme music. It it has played, Kelly. It's Byron Serial Corner. Fuck. You've never listened to our show? You don't know what the music- Well, I couldn't remember which episode you were starting with tonight, (sighs) so- All right, well, so are you- I need more Gushers. Stop eating Gushers. That tin packaging is going to really cause a problem. I don't think it's tin. It's like metal coated on the inside there. Plastic with- Listen, this is I'm not... I'm sure it's bad. This isn't how things work or unwrapped with Mark Summers. We General don't, Mills wouldn't hurt me. Give me that. Kelly. Minneapolis, you don't say. Are you nervous? Me? Yeah. About what? What am I nervous about? Well, about what we're about to embark on. Oh, no, I'm just going to ignore that it's happening. I know you just popped a riddle in. I did. Just for this. I mean, it takes a little while for it to kick in, well. so you'll... We'd be able to track it. I don't like calling it rules. Oh, no. We really don't have rules in terms of topic selection. We used to have the one veto a year in place at some point. Yeah, and then you decided that I wasn't allowed to ever veto no anything. No more vetoes for Kelly. Yeah. I, I would like to go back to the veto no, plan. I don't know. We'll see. But you did request, well, often you request this one thing, which is no children murders. Yep. And spoiler alert... I've granted that request. No, you haven't. You already told me you broke it. Kind of. I mean, according to our Supreme Court, you broke it. (laughs) Considering it's been a bit since the last time I talked some real world verifiable trauma with you all, I thought it might be a good idea to ease you back into it. Oh, great. This is shaping up. Shuffling around with what can feel like the weight of the world pulling you down, the burden of selection seemingly more of a curse than a blessing is common experience in the United States these days. The burden of selection? Mm. Selection of what? However, I'd like to remind you that there was a time when things were worse. Not psychologically strainful, like the shame of spending money you don't have on things you don't really need, or choosing between name brand and generic, but physically more difficult. Collecting goods you'd like to purchase wasn't always as easy as placing them in a steel bin on wheels. What? Produce, charcuterie, and shoes aside, Kelly, how much thought have you put into shopping carts? None. Never. Actually, no, I take that back. The one significant time that shopping carts have taken up mental space for me, you know the little ones? The little kid ones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have like six memories from the first 20 years of my life, and one of them is like how much I love. We're talking full size today, Kelly. So little ones. (laughs) And so I really like little shopping carts. Beyond that, no, I've never given them a moment's thought. So let's go back 85 years in the past to the year of our Lord, 1937. Lord. Cue Guy Lombardo and his Royal Canadians. That year, Amelia Earhart disappeared while attempting Whoa, now that's a story. Her, her round-the-world flight. The, the German airship, the Hindenburg, burst into flames while attempting to dock in Lakehurst, New Jersey, taking Rough the lives of... Th- excuse me? Rough year for air travel. Taking the lives of 35 individuals. Ten steelworkers union demonstrators were killed in Chicago when police opened fire following being hit by a tree branch. That sounds more... Contemporary? Uh, This would soon be known as the Memorial Day Massacre. Tear gas and clubs and bullets casting an ugly cloud. The world was introduced to a surly black duck drawn by Tex Avery. Of course, his name was Daffy. (laughs) 
and an innovative retailer came up with a revolutionary idea that would shake up commerce significantly. Why in the fuck are we talking about shopping carts? That man was Sylvan Nathan Goldman, a World War I veteran, not educated past the eighth grade, having learned the retail trade from his father, a dry goods man, as well as his mother's uncle. Your mother's uncle. Excuse me? Huh. After his time in the military, where he acted as a food requisitionist in that France. That means he got the foods. Y yes, it, it is true. In wartime, it means that you kind of like took the foods. <laughs> yeah, but, he got them. Yeah. He found some post-war success in the wholesale fruits and produce business in Texas during the oil boom. Uh, this streak continued when he and his brother returned to Oklahoma, where they started the state's first supermarket the Sun Grocery Company. Within three years, they had 55 stores, if you can believe it, Kelly. Narrowly dodging- If I started one of my episodes like this- <laughs> no idea. Narrowly dodging the stock market crash of 1929 by months, they sold the chain to Skaggs Safeway for a pretty penny. However, still affected by the crash and limited by a grocery non-compete, they relocated and took advantage of another faltering market, purchasing the Humpty Dumpty grocery chain. And it was here that Sylvan would have his breakthrough. Humpty Dumpty grocery chain? Yeah, it's pretty cool, right? I'm going to look up the logo so I've at least yeah, got sure a visual. Right. Although at this point, people have started moving past store clerks having to grab everything off their grocery list, replacing their arms with a shopping basket in the customer's hands, Sylvan noticed something. As soon as the baskets filled up or became too heavy, the customer stopped shopping. He also noted that housewives were struggling to manage their young children while in the store. Suddenly, an idea came to him. With the help of a carpenter and a maintenance man whose names have been lost to history, big surprise there, they attach wheels to the legs of a folding chair, placing a wire basket on the seat, almost like a crown coronating the first shopping cart. Grocery cart, buggy, trolley, carriage, coo hutter, bass cart, wago, trundler, whatever you call it where you live, Sylvan created some less crude versions, placed them in his stores, and no one used them. Why? People were used to the old times where a, a clerk would walk around and put things in baskets for you. Sylvan didn't give up. In fact, he doubled down, paying people to push loaded carts around the store all day, teaching by example. Soon after... I mean, that, that's one way to put it. I mean, it worked. He, he patented the idea, founding the Folding Carrier Corporation, and the rest is history. What could this possibly have to do with the moon or murders? We're going to get there, I promise you. The design may have changed a little over time, but his technique of transporting goods has solidified itself as a staple in society. And while having achieved wild financial success, he continued attempting to innovate. There was the grocery stacker, the folding inter-office basket carrier, the handy milk bottle rack. He even left the market market with the baggage cart. First guy to make the baggage cart. You know that thing you carry bags around in the airport from your car to the gate check? Oh, like where you have to like put in the coins mm. and like you know, zip zip and then it's yeah, just him. Sylvan and his wife, Margaret Babe Katz, lived out the rest of their days generously giving time and money to a number of causes, including a $1.5 million donation to the Oklahoma Blood Institute when they relocated in 1983. Is that like a fake Actually, Red Cross? I think they study blood or it's a group of vampires. Hmm. Seemingly living the dream, things changed just a year later in November when Babe passed away. He killed her, didn't he? Is that, are we finally getting to it? He killed her. No, just one week later, Sylvan joined her an imaginative man who couldn't imagine his life without her. Oh my god. Now normally I wouldn't go into this amount of detail on such a wholesome topic. We'll be out of here soon. If you are actually craving more of this story though, you can read the obituary in the Washington Post. It's titled The King of Carts. I'm going to drop the, that in the show notes of this episode. But the last line of Sylvan's Wikipedia caught my attention and that's why we're here. Kind of. Both his sons died under suspicious circumstances. Oh, he murdered his kids. Monty in 1995 and Alfred in 1997. That's it. That's all, the last entry of the Wikipedia page. How can I not bite on that? I, I don't. 
easily. His his sons died of mysterious Okay, hold on. Can we back up for a second? Of course. Why were you fucking reading this Wikipedia page to begin with? We'll get there. I promise you. You're going to have to be patient. Wow. I'm not known to leave a suspicious circumstance unturned. But this I probably could have stepped over. I will say, Monty and Alfred, great rich people names. Oh, yeah, for sure. Which makes sense. because They sound British. Well, they weren't. I know. Jewish. Really? Yeah. They were absolutely loaded. The brothers had inherited over $400 million of so that their... $1 million blood donation was bullshit. Drop a blood in the bucket. Actually, $400 million in the 90s wasn't really that I much mean, money. well, it wouldn't last very long. He made that $400 million in uh, the inventions, of course, as well as real estate, banking, and stocks. And his sons were riding high or somewhere at least, on the Forbes 400 Richest Folks list. Really? Yeah. At but only 400 million. I know, right? God, standards. Before it was the 1% divide, man. Who knew? Yeah. But as Christopher George Latour Wallace said, mo money, mo problems. Wait, who said that? It's big and small. Oh, it's oh, right. Forgot about that. They managed- Actually, wasn't it Mace that said that? Right. Technically, you, I think it was Mace. You might know more about 90s rap than I do. I mean, though, like, it was a song, but I think that actually that lyric was sung by. They managed to lose all but $100 million of the fortune thanks to greedy sibling squabbling. In 1990, Monty sued Alfred for allegedly cutting him off from the family business and its income. Some real secession shit. Love it. <laughs> the music's playing. Just sit and enjoy it for just a second. Oh, I, do love I miss it very much. Stop. Although the outcome of the case wasn't made public, all opportunity to bicker over money abruptly ended in January of 1995, when Monty's body was discovered in Aspen, Colorado. Murdered by his brother. Authorities weren't able to determine when he died, but they did decide his death was due to a self-inflicted gunshot wound. I thought Wiki said it was suspicious. I know, right? What the hell? That's not very suspicious. What's your gut say, though, Kelly? What state? Aspen? Aspen? Aspen, Colorado. Colorado. Yeah. Donner Party? Monty was the one who sued Alfred. Monty was the one that died. Yeah, so Alfred hired the ghosts of the Donner Party. Okay. And so they killed him. You're a little bit... I, no? You're a very creative person. We're never going to know what happened for sure. Because in late October of 1997, Alfred would turn a gun on himself. It's a shotgun placed in his mouth. So rumor was that he was struggling with health problems, but... Maybe it's possible that guilt was a contributing factor in this decision? Or maybe it was his brother's ghost. Okay, so so he killed his brother and his brother's ghost no, killed him? No, 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 him? he hired the Donner Party ghost now, to kill his brother. That, that one is his a His brother's strength. ghost I killed him. I hate that. I hate that. It's not even, no. <laughs> I think this has happened. There's no denying the impact of their father's invention, and there's no more personally significant use of it than what I would discover on Channel 48 late one night just a few years later hi i'm johnny knoxville welcome to jackass oh my god october 1st 2000 the premiere of mtv's jackass now i'm not going to explain jackass i shouldn't even be talking about it this is a true crime episode what is happening y'all know the skit the earworm to end all riffy earworms, CKY's 96 bitter beings, starts playing while Deco dons a jack o' lantern helmet. Brandon Bam Margera hawks a loogie in the eye hole, and the shopping cart chaos begins. Arguably one of the more captivating, informative couple minutes of my life. Slow motion DV camera footage of Bam Margera, Ryan Dunn, Brandon DiCamillo, and Rab himself rolling out of moving trucks, shoved into curbs, landing in bushes at breakneck speeds. What the fuck is going on? The here? show was an overnight success, spawning 25 episodes, TV specials, and a successful film franchise. The four theatrical releases alone, making more than Alfred did in his entire life. Just because the CKY crew made it out with only bumps and scratches doesn't mean others didn't get seriously hurt. Inspired even though the program opened with its trademark warning. warning. The following show features stunts performed either by professionals or under the supervision of professionals. Accordingly, MTV and the producers must insist that no one attempt to recreate or reenact any stunt or activity performed on this show. March 2003. A 24-year-old teacher in Ireland was riding down a steep pathway inside a shopping trolley. He made it to the bottom, but there he crashed out, landing hard on his head. Networks moved the show to the 10 p.m. time slot, 
and Owen Williams died five days later. Five years after that, in typical American fashion, things escalated when a Florida teen, Cameron Byberl, also died of a head injury. He, however, was riding in a cart holding on to an SUV driven by his friend, crashing when he hit a speed bump at high speeds. The friend was convicted of vehicular homicide and received a four-year prison sentence with 11 years probation, and his driver's license was permanently revoked. Even Jackass alum Steve-O, during a recent episode of Mike Tyson's podcast, Hot Boxing with Mike Tyson, said the early days of Jackass were a legitimate danger to children. I think at the beginning of Jackass, we were genuinely worth vilifying because back then they didn't have YouTube or video on the internet and we were legitimately a bad influence. You know, really? when, when Jackass you. came out, little kids were showing up in hospitals all over the country and maybe the world because they saw the, us doing this crazy shit and they wanted to do it themselves. And I, I can't say I wasn't one of those kids. I'd love to sit around and talk Jackass all day. And I could. But we should start moving towards the real reason we're here. Oh my god. Listen, most of the time shopping carts don't cause pain. Their convenience far outweighs... That's not true, actually. I was reading while I was trying to stay focused. Uh Uh-huh, yeah. I was reading that in one year, there were like 25,000 children in emergency rooms due to... I'm not going to talk about children. That was part of the rules, Kelly. Due to injuries from shopping carts. Be careful with the kiddos. But what happens when that convenience is used to transport victims of brutal violence? October 24th, 2021 was the last day family and friends heard from Eileen Elizabeth Redmond, age 54, of Harrisonburg, Virginia. She went by Beth, and she had missed work, which was very out of character. She hadn't returned to her apartment either. They also noted that she didn't own a car, so leaving on her own wouldn't be very feasible. The last call she had with her daughter, Beth mentioned she was watching football with her friend, Aunt. She didn't sound- Hold on, her friend, Aunt? Aunt. Could be short for something, I don't know. Like the alien farm? (laughs) Okay, come on now. She didn't sound scared or worried, as if she trusted this guy. The Harrison Police Department publicly announced their investigation into Beth's whereabouts in a press release on November 10th. A little over a week later, and a bit beyond 60 miles southeast, the Charlottesville Police also asked for assistance in finding a missing woman. Hold on, Charlottesville? Charlottesville, Virginia. You been there? Mm, No. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Hi, I'm Kristen. And I'm her little brother, William. We're the team behind the podcast Guide to the Unknown, where we talk about spooky things, the paranormal, horror movies, and so much more. Some of our favorite episodes include Haunted Amusement Parks, Episode 146, Silent Hill, 158, and Cursed Thrift Store Items, 193. With years of shows under our belts, though, we've covered literally hundreds of topics. Guide to the Unknown is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all other podcast apps, in addition to a YouTube version. You can even watch us record new episodes live and chat with other viewers. Find more by following at GTTUPod on all social media or visit GTTUPod.com. Come join the scary fun, everyone. With Guide to the Unknown, there's always more to learn and explore. And with our extensive Patreon catalog, the rabbit hole goes as deep as you want it to. Weird. See you all on Guide to the Unknown, everyone. Tanita Larice Smith, who went by Tina, was reported missing on November 19th. She was last seen on November 14th, and police had reason to believe that she may have been in the Harrisonburg area. It wasn't long until these two women would be located, and sadly, it wasn't the homecoming everyone had hoped for. November 23rd, 2021, two female victims were found inside shopping carts Uh in an open lot in the Harrisonburg Commercial District. While Charlottesville and Harrisonburg Police Departments were conducting separate investigations using cell phone data and surveillance cameras, they narrowed their focus to the lot. It was behind a Howard Johnson and across from a Lowe's. I feel like we all have these box oh, yeah. store districts, mm-hmm. commercial Reserve, zones. Reserve, North Reserve. Yeah, yeah, for us, yeah. If you can do 20-minute intros, I can do local references. This was a little more than a mile away from the Target department store that the carts belonged to. 
Both Beth and Nita were discovered near each other, beaten to death. Oof. November 24th, as a result of that video surveillance and cell phone records, Anthony Eugene Robinson, 35, of Washington, D.C., was arrested, charged with two counts of first-degree murder in addition to two felony counts of concealing, transporting, or altering a dead body. Police in Virginia say they have arrested an alleged serial killer. 35-year-old Anthony Robinson of Washington, D.C. is a so-called shopping cart killer. Obviously, the families were heartbroken at the loss. Nita left behind six children. And unfortunately, this type of tragedy wasn't unfamiliar to the Smiths. Nine years prior, Nita's aunt, a transgender woman, went missing. And uh -oh. still hasn't been found. I, I feel like I could have went into that, but I did so much jackass stuff up top. Oh, yeah, it's clearly well-allocated resources. <laughs> but although this discovery was horrifying on its own, authorities were yet to uncover the true scope of Anthony's crimes. But before we get there, Johnny Knoxville. Oh, my I'm just God. kidding. Who is Anthony Eugene Robinson? Honestly, since this case is so fresh likely the most recent serial killer that I've covered, not much is really known. After the arrest, he quickly lawyered up and hasn't said anything. It was revealed that his last known residence was in Washington, D.C. His job history has been described as transient, which shouldn't be mistaken with him being a transient. Right, right, very different things. Yep. He's bouncing from Quiznos to Subway to... Schlotzkys right. to Jersey Mike's to, to Humpty Dumpty's. Oh, right. he may have worked there. I don't, did you find the logo? Is yeah, they it cool? closed in '85. Ah, that, well, he got out right on time. Huh? Real a lot like Piggly Wiggly. I went to a Piggly Wiggly okay, when I was so, uh, yeah. But they have that in Washington D.C. where Anthony Eugene Robinson was. He also had no criminal record. In what I've read and listened to, most folks researching this case have said that they couldn't find a single digital footprint. But they aren't me. They aren't me, Kelly. Email address, brookland 2 fine at yahoo.com. Do you know I still work with people that have Yahoo yeah, it's, it's offensive. Quote right? from my uncle this week. Uh-oh. Check Yahoo News. They get it before anyone okay. else. <laughs> He's on the pulse here. Uh, so, and with this, uh, in a sea of Anthony Robinson's, I was able to find his Facebook page. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's been scrubbed or partially... Pri Hold on. How do you know that it is the oh, it's right him. one? I, I, it's, it's him. He had... We're just supposed to take your word for it, huh? Well, I'm not going to post it because, well... You don't want to dox a serial killer? No, I don't want to dox his 332 friends. Well, they should have unfriended him long before now. <laughs> okay. Well, here I found out that he is a fan of the TV show How I Met Your Mother, but who isn't? It's okay, peak multi-cam programming. Yeah. I have never seen yeah, an episode. You should check it out. It's now I won't because it's affiliated with the serial Anthony killer. Anthony loves it, but so does America. A majority of all his pictures include him holding children. So I'm assuming he is a father or a father figure. The most recent profile picture included a Facebook frame. You know what those things are? Temporary little... Oh, yeah. Of what? Vote for change from November of 2020. What does that mean? Well, I'm just saying that you should vote, probably. Um, I do know that one of his relatives, I, mean, I don't know exactly who it was, does work for the White House security. Oh, they do? Yeah. Do don't know they? if it's a cousin, a niece, a nephew, a uncle, an aunt. I'm not going to spill those beans. You but aren't? Of course not. No. But below that picture, there was one comment, and it read, I miss you, Anthony. I love you, Anthony. There are several pictures that include a woman that I'll leave unnamed who appears to be or have been his fiance at some point. So one looks like an announcement of sorts, you know, um, them kissing and holding up her hand and there's a, a large wedding ring on display. And that's, that's pretty yeah. clear evidence. A collage of images of this woman were actually used as a cover photo in late 2017. I was able to find her profile as well, but... She's been inactive since January of 2018. Her final post reads, Good morning. I'm giving God all the glory. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for sending the best love of my life. There Thank you, go. Heavenly Father, for my family and friends and covering us in the blood of Jesus and keeping us safe and walking us Ooh. in hard times as well. It's good for you are worthy to be praised for you are the great. And I am in the name of Jesus. I thank you. Amen. Two comments said amen. 
And one from 26 weeks ago asked, what happened to her? How does she still have this active with that stuff up? She just abandoned her page, seemingly. They went on. No more updates since 2018. Does anyone have contact with her? Her relationship status is set to engaged. And at the time of Anthony's arrest, his said single. So she's dead. I don't know. I could continue. Like, you really don't know? I don't, actually. <laughs> what the? Yeah. I could continue, but th- there isn't really anything here that would lead me to believe that Anthony is a serial killer. No additional information. Just speculation. You know, some people are better at keeping things under wraps than others, but rarely forever. December 15th, 2021, in a wooded area off the 2400 block of Fairhaven Lane in Alexandria, Virginia, more carts more bodies in a large black plastic container next to another target shopping cart detectives discovered the remains of two more murdered women both were in more significant stages of decomposition having been there longer than the previous two victims 29 year old cheyenne brown's mother identified her by a unique tattoo and i'm so angry like i i don't even have tears anymore Cause I'm just like, why would you do this to my daughter? She didn't deserve that. You know, she was just so full of life. Cheyenne had a son who was seven at the time. And he has the same heart like his mom. It's like, she's, she's still here with us. She's still here with us. And Cheyenne was also four months pregnant. Uh, okay, so like I said. Yeah. You broke the rule. September 30th in southeast Washington, D.C. was the last time she was seen wearing a burgundy Washington Redskins hoodie with black floral leggings and black shoes. Is this why you're wearing your Blackhawks jersey? No, I I don't have a rivalry. You're just saying like... One of them is football and one of them is hockey, hockey. so that's good. Insensitivity rivalry. Yes. Get off my back. Just saying. October 13th, police consider her a critical missing person. So, I I mean, I've already been talking a bunch of dates. Uh, I'm going to continue talking dates and departments in this report. So apologies in advance if this gets confusing. Okay. Okay. November 30th, D.C. Metro contacted Harrisonburg police and told them about Cheyenne. Cell phone data and surveillance footage would later show that she and Anthony were together on the night that she was last seen. They were at the Metro station in D.C. Okay. A coordinated effort between the Harrisonburg and D.C. police departments began. December 7th, D.C. police called Fairfax County Police and asked for assistance with the search. Digital data showed that the two had been on Route 1 together, across from the recently discovered dumping ground, possibly at a little place called the Moon Inn Motel on the night of the disappearance. Okay, so hold on. How many minutes? 33 minutes. Almost 34. 34 34 minutes. We Happy Moon June, everyone. We've arrived. That just blew up my mind. What? Just because you can't gracefully stretch a Moon June episode? I just can't. I can't even. Fairfax County Police say it was here, right near the Moon Inn in Alexandria, where they found the body of a woman who they believe is 29-year-old Cheyenne Brown. She's one of four alleged victims of the so-called shopping cart killer. Police are hoping to confirm her identity through DNA by the end of next week, but her mom says she already knows it's her from her tattoo. The Moon Inn Hotel. So I looked for a flowery official description of this place, which is honestly nicer than I expected, but the domain is down. I did find a description on their Facebook page. I can't wait. Wonderful hotel with 40 rooms. That's it. You know, I am actually always in awe and admiration of people who can conserve their words like that. It's just not something I'm capable of. Well, and... With all of the talk that we've been having about these people going missing, it actually... Hold on, it, hold on. No, I'm not even fucking kidding right now. Where is this? Did you stay there? Did you stay at the Moon Inn, Kelly? Okay, I actually... Will you send that to Jim? Of course I will. I think... I legitimately think Jim and oh, I might have no. stayed there. All right. It seems that most of these 40 rooms have been empty as of late. Apparently, business hasn't been great after it was revealed to be the meeting place of Anthony and a majority of his victims. Oh, my God. Some reviews from some former patrons. Um, five out of five. This is from E. This was a solo trip. Um, 
My room's wide doorway made it very convenient to roll my target cart in and out. No, somebody didn't do that. Yeah, one out of five. Here is from Kimberly K. Norman Bates approved. Lovely setup. Okay, so hold on. Like, I... As always, it fulfills my needs and my target shopping carts. I don't feel like that's... That is I, not I a agree. Funny it's ha-ha. not very fair. All jokes aside, it's, it sounded like this place was a bit of a dump. It's got an overall 3.2 on Google. People often mention uh, safety atmosphere cleanliness two out of five the room was genuinely not cleaned it had a mouse running around in it as well as two cockroaches were found and killed staff has always been very friendly but their housekeeping and pest control really need to be improved my room had roaches said another one just as seedy as it looks the office is abandoned when they sell out apparently the communal microwave is on the porch next to the office there was flickering electricity on a perfectly sunny clear day you get what you pay for this place didn't even have a safe bed. Mine was falling apart. The bath, and they said the bath think was about, I think they meant sink, was about to fall. I had to place a chair under it. So, I mean, what would you say about this day? It was pretty okay? Okay, so if it is the place, yeah, I'm just trying to remember. I mean, it was... 20 years ago. In an interview with Fox 5 DC, owner Nassar Wagi says the COVID-19 pandemic already made business difficult. But now, because of the investigation, he's trying to sell the property as soon as possible. We cannot survive. It's very difficult. Nobody coming, nobody feels secure, even our employees right now. They're scared because they hear information that it's not a one-person act. Maybe he has somebody outside. Maybe he sent to shoot us. Big problem. Not helping your business there, bud. In that interview, he also revealed that Anthony stayed at the Moon Inn Hotel at least six times. This is not a very good businessman. I do think this is the same person. One of the last posts on the hotel's Facebook page 43 weeks ago was a message and a missing poster. My sister, Stephanie Harrison, last at the Moon Inn, went missing. The poster had a read, Critical Missing, Stephanie Ann Harrison, 48, of Redding, California. She was a long way from home. On September 15th, 2021, the Aware Foundation, a nonprofit that assists families with missing loved ones, posted on Twitter. It read, Stephanie Harrison was last heard from on August 19th, 2021 by family. Stephanie told them that she was at the Capitol building in Washington, DC. Her sister checked her bank records. It showed that she checked into the Moon Inn Motel in Alexandria, Virginia. That is the last time anyone has heard from her. Stephanie had traveled from her home in California to tour the Capitol and other sites. She was last known wearing black dress pants, a gold-colored blouse, and a black pea coat. She also has the outline of a Playboy bunny on her ankle. Stephanie suffers from schizophrenia and is in need of medications and may need medical attention. She's very vulnerable and gullible in her mental state. This same foundation would go on to laminate and distribute missing posters across the region, and this would prove very helpful in her being identified as a victim. According to Stephanie's family, she was a beloved mother and even better grandmother. Her daughter said, quote, There wasn't a day that went by my mom didn't call multiple times a day. I miss hearing her voice. Due to COVID, I had already separated from her the last two years. I never thought that that last time I hugged her would be the last time. With Anthony behind bars and digital evidence mounting, a joint press conference was held on December 17th, 2021. Everybody ready? Fairfax County Police Chief Kevin Davis, Harrisonburg Police Chief Kelly Warner, and Major Ed O'Carroll, commander of the Major Crimes and Cyber and Forensics Bureau, all took turns introducing the world to the shopping cart killer. Here are the main takeaways. Uh, We're here today to talk about a serial killer. And uh, that is a phrase that I've used sparingly in my three decades in this profession. Uh, I've been in a leadership role for the last decade or so at several departments in the National Capital Region and the the DMV, and I can count on one hand with, with a couple fingers left over the number of times where law enforcement has had to grapple with the uh, impact of a serial killer. We have a serial killer. The good thing is he's in custody. Uh, The challenge that remains is identifying 
other victims. And we're going to talk about that at, at great length. Uh, our serial killer is called the shopping cart killer. He's called the shopping cart killer because he meets his victims. And so far we have four. Three are positively, two are positively identified, one is tentatively identified, and one is unknown. Uh, he meets his victims on dating sites. Uh, after he inflicts trauma to his victims and kills them, he transports their bodies to their final resting place, literally in a shopping cart. And there's video to that effect. And what's his MO? Dating sites, motels, blunt force trauma, shopping cart, final resting place. Uh, he's killed four already, and we, we suspect that, that he has more victims. He preys on the weak, he preys on the, the, the vulnerable, um, and he does unspeakable things with his victim. Our, our shopping cart killer does unspeakable things with his victims. And it's our collective duty and responsibility to bring justice and closure to all of our communities. Not another dating app killer. I guess I'm, I'm not that familiar really? with oh. dating app killers. Oh, he's doing a good job of making it harder to find love out there. So he used a couple of dating apps. One, one I'd never heard of called Tagged, but mainly hmm. Plenty of Fish. I've, I've never heard of any of those. I am old. Plenty of Fish, uh, now going by POF, wonder why they're rebranding, is uh, where singles have more conversations than any other dating app. It's uh, more than just a dating app. It's an experience. It's also pretty dangerous. POF has uh, also been the preferred vehicle of numerous dating app murders. Two cousins are accused of using a dating app to lure two men to their deaths. 32 Polk County investigators say a young father was robbed and killed after a date with a woman he met online. Now to that frightening story from a woman who says she dated a self-proclaimed serial killer. The man accused of using dating sites to prey on and attack women. Now one is coming forward saying she narrowly avoided the same fate. I believe it's due to the fact that they require a lot less verification than other competitors like Tinder or Hinge. Huh. Seems uh, weird. Yeah. That if, yeah. It's also free. So not a lot of barriers okay. to entry there. At this point, Chief Kelly Warner steps in. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I join uh, Chief Davis in sending our condolences to all the victims' families and this uh, tragedy that happened across uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, on November 23rd, uh, 2021, uh, Harris Harrisonburg Police Department identified two uh, female victims that were found dead in an open lot in a commercial district of the city of Harrisonburg. Anthony Robinson, age 35, was arrested um, as a result of video surveillance and cell phone records that connected him to two uh, victims. The first victim, as Chief Davis uh, mentioned, was Elizabeth Redmond, age 54, of Harrisonburg, and Tanita Lurie Smith, age 39, of Charlottesville. Harrisonburg Police Department and Charlottesville Police Department were conducting two separate missing persons investigations, which resulted in narrowing the focus to the search this open lot. Uh, both women were discovered within a short distance of each other. Uh, dead, um, although their deaths took place at two separate times. On November 30th, uh, 2020, a Metropolitan PT, PD contacted the Harrisonburg Major Crimes Division and noted that the last known person that uh, a missing person that they were investigating had contact with Robinson. Um, it was a result of that information um, HPD Major Crimes was able to determine that through cell phone records um, that contact took place in and around the area of the Moon Inn uh, in, uh, on Richmond Highway in Alexandria. Uh, then we received contact from Fairfax Police Department and Major O'Carroll's team contacted us. And so then we began this coordinated effort uh, to track down more victims, uh, unfortunately, that were at the hands of this shopping cart killer, uh, Mr. Robinson. So now I'd like to introduce Major Okan. So Kelly's a little bit nervous, and she definitely just uh, introduced Major O'Carroll as uh, 
O'Connor, but... I'm nervous, too. I understand this. I appreciate that. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as introduced, I'm Major Ed O'Carroll. I have the pleasure of Correct, heading the Fairfax County Police Department's Major Crime, Cyber, and Forensics Bureau. Ten days ago, on December 7th, detectives from the Fairfax County, Virginia Police Department received a call for uh, assistance from the Metropolitan Washington, D.C. Police Department uh, for help in locating a missing female. My team immediately pulled resources together to aid in the search. Detectives were informed uh, that Ms. Cheyenne Brown, 29, of Washington, D.C., took the metro from Washington, D.C. to the Huntington Metro stop on September 30th and never returned. Digital data showed that Ms. Brown was in the 6100 block of Richmond Highway, possibly at the Moon Inn on the night of her disappearance. Homicide detectives, with assist, assistance of a cadaver dog from the George Mason University Police Department, res responded to the Moon Inn in that immediate area and conducted a search. Unfortunately, we were unable to locate Ms. Brown or any evidence relevant to her whereabouts. Uh, my team traveled to Harrisonburg uh, to meet uh, the chief and her detective team and to gather additional intelligence about the link between Miss Brown and our suspect and the nexus to Fairfax County. Detectives from my homicide squad coordinated with the Metro Transit Police Department and actually located video surveillance of Miss Brown at the Huntington Metro stop on September 30th. We authored a search warrant, executed for cellular data, and we received it immediately, confirming that Miss Brown and the suspect were at the same location on September 30th, the night of her disappearance. Video surveillance confirms that the victim and the suspect were to get together in Washington, D.C. at the same metro stop on that fateful night. Ugh. This past Wednesday morning, new information was provided that took my detectives back to the area of the Moon Inn to expand their original search. Wednesday afternoon, just two days ago on December 15th, homicide detectives found uh, what, what had caught their eye, which is in the uh, wooded area just off Route 1 of um, uh, an item that uh, required a little bit more of investigative uh, research. Remembering that the victims in the Harrisonburg murders were transported by using a shopping cart, detectives observed a shopping cart in the wooded area, not far from the Moon Inn. Besides the shopping cart was a lone container. When detectives looked inside uh, the lone container, their worst fears were confirmed. They observed what appeared to be human remains. We contacted the office of the medical examiner. They responded, along with an anthropologist from the George Mason University, Dr. Falsetti. And thank you to the doctor and the team. The initial analysis done on the scene confirmed what we thought. Likely, human remains were inside. Through a coordinated effort between the Fairfax County Police Department, Harrisonburg, the Metropolitan Police Department, detectives tentatively believe the remains discovered in the container are that of Miss Brown. As the chief uh, mentioned, Chief Davis mentioned, the tentative identification is based upon a very distinct tattoo that Miss Brown had on her body. Oh, this is Sadly, these remains were not alone in the container. There may be other victims in this case. And we are asking for anyone Hold on, wait, with wait, additional wait, stop information for a to come forward. There were additional remains. There yeah. may be other victims. So like I said earlier, this happened before they identified the fourth body, which would soon be Stephanie Harrison. Okay. Yeah. Uh, during questions, they confirmed that Anthony hadn't yet cooperated or made a statement that they're working backwards to determine where he was employed, who he knows, stuff like that. It was uncertain if these attacks had a sexual component, but I think that that's I mean, the likely. whole thing about unspeakable things that he did to them. Well, that was the, I mean, they don't know what happened to the two in the tub, because at that point they had been so, so 
Yeah. Yeah. But the other two had been obviously brutalized. Um, but I mean, my guess is that the dating app thing, he was taking advantage of desperate, lonely women. People don't often use that app to find friends, but they, they mentioned a... I've been doing it all wrong. <laughs> a, a, quote, remarkable absence of a criminal record, noting nothing other than the four recent charges, two counts of first-degree murder, two felony counts of concealing, transporting, and altering a dead body. It was also said several times that they believe some victims survived. They know more and are being asked to come forward. It's a tragedy. Yeah, I see you kind of shaking your head, and I agree. This case has a shake in our head. Why? Because uh, uh, the victims did nothing wrong. Didn't have to happen. So we're only going back a couple, two or three months. That's it. And that's what worries us. Uh, you know, he, he didn't suddenly turn into who he is three months ago. So that, that's why we're painstakingly going through his whereabouts, his relationships, his employment history, uh, to, to figure out uh, if, in fact, there are other victims. And like Major O'Carroll said, he may have had interactions with, with women that he's met on these dating sites who have, uh, for whatever reason, um, know something about him. Uh, it didn't go that far, obviously, with them, but no doubt in my mind that these are not the only four women, uh, at least three, maybe four, that he's made contact with through his, his dating sites. There are, there are others, and we need to, to do our best uh, to identify them. How do they meet dating sites? Uh, how are they killed? Trauma to the body. Uh, how are they transported to their final resting place? The shopping cart. Hence, shopping cart killer. And, and I don't want to give this guy a cape, get it. but oh that's who he is. Oh, my God. He's a killer. He's a serial killer. Uh, we know who he is. Thank God he's behind bars right now. But that still doesn't take away from the urgency that exists to identify any other victims that might be out here, literally beyond the Commonwealth of Virginia and, and up the East Coast. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I've got a question because the hotel motel owner, All right. yeah. I didn't say Holiday Inn, mm -hmm. um, said that there might be another one out there. Uh, that's just rumors of a buzz. I, I don't see any Why evidence of Why would he that. buzz that? I don't know. I mean, he had been talking with Okay, hold on. I've got a theory. Okay, what's your theory? He's the other one. You think... Well, that would make sense in like the horror film kind of way, you know, like the victim gets away and runs to the lobby and it's like, help, call 911, 911, and then he's like, okay, they'll be right here. You know, he does like the Texas Chainsaw. Yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to figure out why in the world a man who is distraught about his business going under would literally put <sighs> ironclad nails in the coffin. I don't know. Rumors fly when this kind of stuff happens to a community. I wouldn't say that anything he heard is more than just something he heard. Yeah, but, well... I don't okay. know. It just seems uh, do you have any strong feelings about giving serial killers a, a moniker? I mean, it seemed very... You mentioned horror movie style. Yeah. It seemed very Hollywood-like that they would do that. Do you think it gives them a cape? Yeah, and it... I don't know. It is. It seems very sensational. Yeah. And odd and i don't know how that's productive in serving well, whatever goals they have it might actually it get them, me out might actually get them in trouble here in a little bit uh oh it didn't take long to tie another potential victim to anthony eugene robinson here we go here's two news anchors who are far too enthusiastic about murder prepare for some serious broadcaster voice first tonight two victims of the shopping cart killer have been identified and police say the suspect may be linked to a fifth murder fairfax county police believe anthony robinson is responsible for the deaths of cheyenne brown and stephanie harrison both were found in a container near the moon in motel in alexandria last month my size paris jones is live in fairfax tonight he has the details paris robinson could be linked to a potential fifth victim a woman who was found dead in a shopping cart in Washington, D.C. Fairfax County Police spokesman Anthony Gugliami tweeted, quote, This week we received a credible tip that suggests our person of interest may be a person of interest. Hmm. In a Washington, D.C. case where a woman was found deceased in a shopping cart, digital information places him in the area at the time of her disappearance. 
The body of the woman in question was found by authorities in the Washington, D.C. area. Fairfax County Police Chief Kevin Davies and Major Ed O'Carroll quickly arranged another press conference on the night of January 7th. They confirmed the identity of Stephanie Harrison and Cheyenne Brown, announced they're working with the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit, as well as the authorities in Anthony's home state of New York, and they were working on creating a victimology profile determining commonalities. Wow. Uh, O'Carroll announced a revelation. Just this week, we received a tip, a critical tip, that our person of interest may be linked to another case where a woman was found deceased in a shopping cart in Washington, D.C. My detectives immediately contacted the Metropolitan D.C. Police Department to share this information. That deceased woman in a shopping cart was covered only with a blanket. We believe this may be Anthony Eugene Robinson's fifth victim. This is based on digital evidence that puts him in the same vicinity around the time of the victim's disappearance. Sad and tragic. Sonia Champ was found on the 200 block of F Street Northeast around 11.30 a.m. on September 7, 2021, when a passerby called 911 to record an unconscious person. When first responders arrived, they found her lifeless body inside a shopping cart covered by a blanket. She was pronounced dead at 12.15 p.m. During this conference, they mentioned that they have communicated with 35 different law enforcement agencies to go over missing person cases, departments stretching from New York to Virginia. The press pushed for details of what Anthony was saying to investigators, but as they're actively building a case, they're forced to keep details to themselves. Well, I, I think there may be a point in time in the future where we're able to discuss those particular details. Uh, you know, the curiosity surrounding serial killers is not lost on us. Uh, we're just as curious as, as anyone else, yeah, and not... we need to find answers, but we have to right. do so methodically and in a way that doesn't compromise the integrity of the investigation or the ability of prosecutors to to bring justice to to family so there are some questions many questions actually that we just can't answer yet but as we continue to talk about anthony eugene robinson uh, in the future we imagine we might be able to to shed some light on some of those questions there's just so much about the way that this is being covered and just the story that we're hearing, primarily the parts where we're actually hearing the dialogue from the detectives, mm -hmm. that I'm like, what the fuck? That's not how they're supposed to do that, is it? Well, it may or may not be. Just a few weeks ago on June 14th, Anthony was officially declared the sole person of interest in Sonia's death. Uh, shortly after this second press conference, Anthony's defense lawyer filed a motion asking the court to order the police to stop referring to his client as a, quote, serial killer, as well as the shopping cart killer. He also requested that the court prevent the police in Harrison and Fairfax County from releasing any information on the case to the media without the court's permission. This guy, Louis Nagy, pointed out that the cause of death of the further decomposed victims hadn't been determined yet, and that these press conferences were an attempt to prejudice the public. That the nickname was specifically designed to ensure that it would be repeated and used by every media outlet in the country. I mean, I don't necessarily disagree with that, but I don't understand why that's serving their interests. Serving the... The detective's interest. Well, it did help to spread the case. This was something that a lot of folks brought to my attention over the last few months, begging me to cover really? it. Really? Well... You don't say. Yeah, it's been on my... Buster? Well, the problem with it is there's really not that much to cover, so sometimes you gotta write about the history of shopping carts and your interest in the television program <laughs> Jackass. To, wow. To pad the story, but uh, Fairfax County police spokesman Gugliotti said in a statement, quote, Fairfax County has a proven track record of conducting meticulous and methodical criminal investigations to pursue justice for victims and to hold offenders accountable. This case is no exception. While the defendant will enjoy the presumption of innocence, the Fairfax County Police Department stands by its criminal investigation and we look forward to presenting our findings in a court of law. 
And unfortunately, this is where we're going to have to stop the story for now. Hum dinger. Yeah, with Anthony's next court appearance scheduled for September 12th. I'm sure we'll have an update on Behind the Screams or something like that. Obviously, with a case like this, I don't really have a bow to tie. Uh, but I do think... Wow, thanks, Byron. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I think it would be a good idea to wrap up with a request from Ed O'Carroll. Uh, a, a bit of a plea. The last time I was at this podium to talk about this case, we asked for the public's help. Here we are, 21 days later, and we still need your help. We still need more information about Robinson. We received many phone calls about abandoned shopping carts in Fairfax County after the last press conference. But what we really need is information about previous contacts that any member of the listening public um, may have about Robinson. Because this case is not about shopping carts. It's about a serial killer. Who tell took Byron. the lives Somebody of innocent tell Byron. women. I'm sorry. So no matter what jurisdiction you live in, if you had contact with Robinson, we urge you to contact the Fairfax County Police Department or your local law enforcement agency if you think you can help. Yeah, so I, I know that our reach is limited, but if you know something or know someone who does, you should contact the Fairfax County Police Department Major Crime Bureau by calling uh, 703-246-7800. You can even do that anonymously by calling 1-866-411-TIPS. That's shopping carts. Wow. And the shopping cart killer for now. Wow. Happy Moon June. I feel so betrayed. You feel betrayed? You have no idea what you just did to my dedication to making Turkey Month just miserable for you. Don't you dare. Yep. Don't you dare. Yep. Oh, I'm going to stoop to You're going to base new the lows. whole thing? Yep. Please don't. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about this case? I mean... My thought about it is uh, it was an interesting, and like you said, it's weird because it's very current, but it's an interesting insight to how things are covered and how they're handled by the authorities. Yeah. And I got to say, it's not helping pivot my perception of the authorities. I don't know. I mean, of course, people are curious, and the media needs juicy bits of details, and they didn't really provide too terribly much beyond what they saw at the crime scenes, you know? They didn't say a dang thing about Anthony. I had to go find his Facebook page. Yeah, I just mean, I, I do think the title, the moniker, all of that yeah. is very sensationalized. Well, absolutely. It's the only reason this was on my radar so often. And in just the way that they're talking about it, I don't know if it's intentional or if it's just they're fucking oh, stupid. Oh, oh, Carol writes like a true crime podcaster, but like a cheesy one. It, it's like they're trying to encourage curiosity and fascination with it. And I guess my sensitivity always goes back to the conversation I have every time there's a new big shooting. Yeah. I always sit down and talk with our therapist about how much it freaks me out the the psychological threshold theory of the more attention something gets the more commonly known an activity becomes mm -hmm. the lower the bar becomes for like the next most susceptible group of people and it just is an sure. exponential growth model for people who are willing to do those things because it becomes part of kind of like just the public conscious that's, that's the dilemma of being a true crime podcaster, honestly. Yeah. You know, uh, a lot of news organizations. You could just go paint Lindsay and just look like a complete douchebag all the time. take pictures of me giving peace signs, wearing sunglasses Fucking everywhere I go. a classless pile of shit. Okay. We can't fully turn on pain. I, I, I'm not turning anywhere. All right. Well, you know, a lot of responsible news organizations have taken to not even saying the names of a serial killer. Which I really like. Pardon me. I'm down with it. I do too. But when you're in this industry. We got to get creative. Byron, you're a really creative human being. I no. think we can work around that. Oh, I, show me some evidence. Some evidence that you're creative? Yeah. It's literally your career. Oh, yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah. And I did start out. Wouldn't know that by the fucking jersey shopping. you're wearing. Stop it. It's just what a is hockey with that? jersey. Why are you 
Those things are expensive. Why do you have this? Well, I bought an expensive hockey jersey because I felt like the, it would force me to be interested in an extracurricular event, a social viewing of hockey. So I've been meaning to talk to you about serial killers. Like that's exactly the kind of thought process a sociopath would have. Okay. Additionally, did you notice the gentleman who we will not name with the face tattoos was driving a Honda Fit? I did. Yeah. I okay. can't I can't not notice that. Okay. I just wanted to um, just point out those couple of things for you to percolate on for a while. Well Thanks, okay. Byron, for that great report. Well, you're very welcome, Kelly. I, is this the close of Moon June? <sighs> Feeling really bad about going out like this. Yeah. Uh I actually was talking to my dad on the way over here. He was really sad to hear that Moon June was coming to a close. Well, I was like, okay. Dad, it's July. It's boo It is boo It's the month where we go all out. It's boo We go hardcore. We're going to fucking twist your minds. <laughs> Kelly, until next week, where are you going to be? Oh, uh, I'm going to be at a wedding and getting ready to go okay. to Oregon. and right. um, you be can... on Discord? Actually, I think I am going to jump on Discord. That's what I'm going to do during your next report. That's a good idea. Wait, what? Yeah, I will be around. You can email me, Kelly, at Friday.com. We do have True Tales coming up, folks. Yes, we're going to be on the And unless you want a 45-minute piece of creative Don't threaten history people with creepypasta, please. About, no, but like it's a personal creepypasta. I'm writing a oh, creepypasta. We're not going to listen to this. Yep. The journey Say it. Say it. George Bulba does. We're yeah, not yeah. doing so that. So it's going to be... A George Bulbados creepy creepy pasta. Unless I get some, I'm like, gonna need you. Good if, stories if from anything you guys. ever scary has happened to you, or not just paranormal, anything frightening. I need you to write in Kelly at Friday.com. Subject line: True Tales. Subject terror. line: Kelly gets a 20 minute meandering intro. Nope, next time. it wasn't meandering. It was very pointed. It was so fucking meandering. And I'm at Byron McCoy on Twitter and Instagram. Byron at Friday.com is my email address. Uh, let me know what your favorite jackass skit was. Um, but yeah, until next episode of Fright Day, I'm Byron. I'm Kelly. Pay for your dating apps. Go to the farmer's market and meet someone there. <laughs> Stay scared. You've been listening to an Audio Wool original produced by Byron McCoy. Theme music provided by Cemeteries. For more programs like this, visit audiowool.co.